I think almost everybody here this evening was here this morning. I am not going to read all the announcements inside the bulletin. If you haven't picked one up, please do so on your way out. A lot of good information inside and on the outside of your bulletin also. Next Sunday, following work, morning worship service, there will be a potluck meal. Everyone's encouraged to attend. Next Sunday evening, the traveling youth group will be at Little Hawking uh, Church of Christ at 5. And next Monday evening will be the Monday night merge at North End. So, uh, if there's some more events listed on the back of your bulletin, please read through those. Plan to attend as many as you can. Is there anything else that needs to be announced this evening? Okay, Dwayne's going to be leading our singing. Everybody join him. Let's start off this evening with song number 564. Number 564. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. 
try me and know my anxious thoughts. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, thanks for the wonderful opportunity that you all had to gather here to learn your word. Please be at those previously mentioned on the prayer list so they can do all their so they can get through all their troubles. Please be with all of us here so everything done might be pleasing in your eye. And please let us all walk away here having learned something from your word that we can apply to our everyday lives. As your son's righteous name we pray. Out your songbooks for this next song due to some technical difficulties, and that will be number 721. Number 721. When Jesus comes to reward his servant, whether it be noon or night, faithful to him.
Psalms 139, as we, we uh, I kind of teased this lesson a little bit this morning, talking about uh, the, um, no, the, um, I can't even say it. Um, 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 the uh, potent, omnipotent, there we go. Uh, the omnipotence of God, uh, the, the um, power of God, and things like that. So uh, as we start to learn this morning our God is all powerful and and God created us and sustains us and by his great uh, might and power we talked this morning about how God created us and we left us on that note this morning how God created us and and we go back to Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and think about the creation and how God created us and, and, and those you know and I know as Christians you've probably read those chapters I don't know how many times but but many times, and some of them, we might be able to quote, you know, a few verses from those and things like that. But those are two good uh, chapters to go back and, and review and understand, especially in today's day and age. You know, you, you go back 50 years ago, and they were important, but it was a different landscape back then. Almost everybody believed that there was a creator named God. Nowadays, that's not the case. And people think that there's the Big Bang Theory and different theories that they have. And so I encourage you to read Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and, and see if that might help you with that, if, if that's what you think or, or whatever. Um, they're, they're wonderful chapters to look back on. 
But I want to uh, go this evening uh, first to God sustains us. And we kind of talked about that. Not only he created us, but he sustains us. Verse 16 of Psalms 139. You, your eyes saw my unformed substance. Your eyes, God's eyes, saw our unformed substance. So when we're in our mother's womb, so small that the, the ultrasound can not make us out, not, cannot make heads or tails or anything else, God's eyes know we're there and he sees our unformed, and that's a key word there, substance. Um, you know, and there's a lot of talk about, well, when does a person become a, you know, a person? And, and, and is it at birth or is it, you know, before birth? But like I mentioned this morning, scripture points to, to really the conception of that person uh, when, when, when it comes together. I don't want to get too graphic in, in, in that area, but basically when things come together, um, you know, God sees our unformed substance and God knows us and he plans for us. And in your book uh, were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me. And so God knows all about us, and when as yet there was none of them. So, so God knows our substance, he, he, he sustains us. In other words, he, he gives us what we need. If we go back to the Old Testament and look what they needed to survive, and that they needed food, they needed water, they needed clothing. And, and you know, we say that we say they went out in the wilderness for 40 years, and we know they did, wandering in the wilderness. And, and I don't know if you've ever wandered before. Um, I certainly have wandered. Um, in, in different places, but can you imagine wandering the same place for 40 years? And, and you're trying to find out kind of where you're going, but you end up really not going anywhere and, and until your generation dies off because it's under punishment um, from God for not having what? Faith. Isn't that interesting? Faith, we look at in the New Testament, we'll look at one verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 tonight, and, and, and we know that faith is so important and sometimes we have great faith, and sometimes our faith needs a little help, but Israel was punished because they didn't have great faith. And they didn't have great faith in God. So God sustains us, he upholds us, he preserves us. And, and again, David uh, argues for life, his life, in the womb of his mother. But he goes further and, and tells us that God sustains us. This is not to be understood uh, as an endorsement for predestination or anything like that. David did not believe in predestination, nor does God. David's choices and sins were his own, just like ours are. We choose to do what we do, don't we? When we, when we sin, that's our choice. You know, we used to say, or have said, maybe, the devil made me do it. You might remember that. I haven't heard that in a long time, to be honest with you. But that used to be an old slogan when somebody would get caught doing something. Oh, the devil made me do it. And, and, and you automatically get a pass if that's the case. Oh, the devil made you do it. That's okay. Well, really, if you did it, it wasn't the devil making you do it. It was you wanting to do it. It was your will that kind of pushed you into that situation, no matter what that sin would be. And, and so... You know, David's choices and sins were his own, just as ours, and David freely admitted that he had sinned in Psalms 32. I did a lecture uh, on King David years ago, and so many years ago, probably about 12 or 14 years ago that I did it, maybe longer. Um, anyway, the point of it was, was his life, and I really focused in the lecture on all the wonderful things that King David did. Because if you have to sum up his life, uh, uh, there are so, you know, it's 99% wonderful things. 1% a sin that what? Everybody remember. And from that one sin, we see several Psalms 51, Psalms 32, uh, I think there's one or two more Psalms written just because of that one sin. And, and we kind of think, well, how does sin really affect our life? Well, we can look at David and see that really affected his life, didn't it? That affected his, his relationship with his wife. That, that affected so many things. His child uh, died and all kinds of things because of that one sin. And so we can see everything there. So um, he admitted that he had sinned in Psalms 32. 
For matter of fact, Psalms 32 and verse 5 says, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I do not cover my iniquity. In other words, he's acknowledging his sin to God. Uh, he said, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David knows that, that God can see his sin and knows his sin and has the power to forgive his sin. The key there was God knew that his, he had sinned and he acknowledged it to the Lord. He didn't try to hide it. David used the words, days were fashioned for me in, in the verse we just looked at in, in verse 16 just a few moments ago to underscore the omnipotency of God and he knows everything and can do all things except to deny his nature. And, and he created us. He knows best how we work. There was a man who um, was driving a, a, a car, and, and this was an older man, and, and he normally went by horse and buggy. This is back in the day when, when cars kind of, you know, kind of first came out. And, and he normally was a horse and buggy type guy, and this was his first car. He bought a used Model T. And, and so the car broke down inside the road, and, and he's all flustered and everything else is sitting inside the road. And, and a man comes by and said, can I help you? Help help you with your car. And he goes, man, I should have never gave up that horse and buggy. I could get from point A to point B. And, and you know, this car has just been a pain, and I don't know what's wrong with it. And he goes, can I look at it for you? And the guy goes, well, if you think you can do something with this car, you go right ahead. You, you, you look at it. And the guy looked at it, and he, he fixed it very quickly. Starts off, ready to go down the road, and he asked him his name. He said his name was Henry Ford. He says, I invented the car. I know how it works. Well, God invented us, so to speak. He made us, and he knows how we work. He knows our inner parts. He knows everything about us. And we might... <clears throat> We might say he knows what makes us tick. So God made us, and, and no one like God can make us run the way we were made to run or to fix us when we are broken down. He even records our every day in the book of life. Have you ever thought about that? When you read through the book of Revelation, and, and we see indications that God is writing. You know, when we look, think of God's writing, we just think of the Bible, but there's other indications that there's written books, if you will. And, and so my behavior, your behavior, the things we do that are good and things we do that are bad are, are, are written, supposedly written down by God. And so he's keep, keeping a record account. Now, now, we don't understand how he's all present, so we probably don't understand how to keep track of everything, but he can, and he does, because he's God. Well, lastly, this evening, and this is a, a longer point, if you will, God loves us. Not only has he created us, not only has he sustained us, keeps us going, but he loves us. In, in verses 17 through 18 of Psalms 139, it says, how precious to me are your thoughts. This is David talking about God. He says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I'm still with you. In other words, David is saying, looking up at God and saying, God, you just, your, your thoughts. And so our scope, of, of, if you will, of God's thoughts are what? The Bible. And, and I, you know, we might have a lot of Bible knowledge in, in the average church. I could ask you or give you a quiz and say, do you know this, this, or this? And you might say, yes, I do. But I doubt that, that anybody knows everything about God. And if you even take some of the best preachers that have been preaching for years and years and years, I even have two preachers I know of that have photographic memories. Now, I kind of wish as a preacher I would have a photographic memory. That means you can read a passage and pretty much quote it. Isn't that pretty cool? Wouldn't you like to have that type of memory? I don't have that. If I read a passage, I would have to study it and repeat it and study it and repeat it and write it down or something like that to be able to quote it. But even those people don't know everything about God. From just what we're told about God, they don't know everything about God. 
For a matter of fact, most people who study the Bible, every time they open their Bible, if they're, if they're serious students of the Bible, every time they open their Bible and, and read a little bit, they what? Learn something new about God. So David compares this to sand. And if you've ever seen a beach, and I know most of you have, it's impossible to count sand. I mean, even if you pick up a handful of sand in your hands and, and dump it on a table or something, you still can't count what's on that table because it's so vast. And, and that's God's thoughts and, and, and the sum of them. So David closes this section of the psalm by praising him for his infinite love. And, and God thinks wonderful and immutable thoughts about us constantly. Now, we see God, the world kind of sees God as a little different. They see God as, as the judge and the policeman. You're doing this, shame on you. You've sinned. That's not necessarily the way, and, and, and is God ju a judge? Yes, he is, but he's a fair judge. He's a righteous judge, and he's a compassionate judge. And, and so we have to add all those things in. He's just not, oh, you did that wrong. Not oh, James, James, I got you now. That, that's not God at all. If that was God, nobody would stand a chance. God is a forgiving God. God loves us, and his thoughts about his people are wonderful. As anybody, you, know, you might think, well, this person doesn't like me, or that person doesn't like me, or, or, or something like that. But when God thinks of us, the church, he loves us. He, he thinks good things about the church. He, he doesn't focus on the negative of the church. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely, there always is. But he thinks good things about his people constantly. He knows us with all our faults. And he knows that we make mistakes. He put Adam and Eve on this earth and knew that they would what? Make mistakes. And he provided a plan for them. He provided a plan for Noah and his family. And it was a plan that would lead them to salvation from the flood. He cares about us. He loves us. And sometimes... We have a hard time focusing on that. When we look at God in a different light. David earlier in the Psalms penned these words in Psalms chapter 40 and verse 5. He says, You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. Your wondrous deeds. Well, a deed is when, when I do something for somebody or someone does something for me. And, and so David says, God, the deeds that you do for us are just so wonderful. We can't even count them. They're, you know, your thoughts about us, your thoughts towards us. No one can but compare with you, David says. I will proclaim and tell them, yet they are more that can be told. So David says, you know, I'm going to talk about the good things you do for me, God, but there's so many good things you do for me, God, I don't know how I'm talking about them all. Now, is that the story that we often tell about God? The story we often tell is, well, God's the judge, and if you don't um, follow his plan of salvation, you're going to hell. That's the story that the world generally sees, isn't it? But the story that God draws out is he's a loving God. He's a caring God. Yes, absolutely he wants you to follow him. But he, he's not on, on a course to destroy people. He wants us to love him and he loves us. Providentially, God takes care of us. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. There's the qualifier. Those who love God, usually Christians. All things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Once again, uh, qualifying us as Christians, if you will. So, so the Apostle Paul would say, you know, that, that's a good deal. Things will work for you. Now, here's the plan. We don't know how they're going to work. 
I, I can't give you a, a plan that this is going to happen this day, this is going to happen the next day, and this is going to happen down then. Nobody can give you that plan of, of how God's going to do it. We just have to have what? Faith that God will. Faith that God will work together for good for us, and, and, and he surely will. God thinks of us always. God thinks of us always. His love is our most important weapon against sin. On the pages of his sacred word, we read of his great love and his unspeakable gift for us. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15, Paul writes, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Think about the Apostle Paul for a second. He, you know, Saul of Tarsus was his name before his name was changed, and, and he was on a route, if you will, um, to arrest Christians. That was his purpose in life that, that he seen to arrest Christians. He saw um, on the road to Damascus, he saw a light that blinded him. He had a conversation with Jesus. He was told to go to Damascus. He would be told what to do. He became a Christian, and his life drastically changed from that point. Not for the bad, but for the good. So love, according to Paul, never fails. We know 1 Corinthians 13, 8, love never fails, or love never ends, is the way the English Standard Version. He says this, for prophecies, they'll pass away. For tongues, that they will cease. For knowledge, it'll pass away. But love never ends. Now the fact that, that I am with God, and he is with me, and you are with God, and he is with you, is the assurance of all of us need to survive in this life. If, you know, I, I've mentioned this before. If, if I don't have God, well, then I don't have lunch. If I went through this life and, and knew at some point I would face my death and did not have God in my life, well, well, then I would have nothing. I would have no hope for eternity. That would be it. Whatever years that I spent on this earth, would be my hope. But that's not the case. The case is we have God. The case is we have eternity with Jesus Christ. And that's what we look forward to. Finally, David makes a request, beginning at verse 19 of God. Here's his request, verse 19 and following. Oh, that you would slay the wicked. Oh, but we don't like the wicked, do we? Oh, that you would slay, and that word slay comes from, you know, if you're, if you're taking a sword and, and, and killing someone. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. Men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malice intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you? Now watch that, verse 21 of Psalm 139. Do I not hate those who hate you? Now, I was told growing up that we're never supposed to use the word hate. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. My mom and dad would not let me ever use the word hate. That was almost a cuss word in our house. And for whatever reason, that's just what. You don't hate anybody. Now, you might, you know, you don't hate broccoli. You might strongly dislike broccoli, but you don't hate broccoli. But here we see David saying to God, I'm going to hate because when it comes to sin, it's okay for us to hate what? Sin. That's different than hating something. You know, and the reason I was told that is, is because normally in, in, in our day, in, in you know, that day and time, it, it was called up with people. I hate this person or that person or another person. That was it. You're not supposed to hate anybody. Maybe you don't like that person as much as you like the other person. But you don't, no, I, I don't care what they do to you. You don't hate anybody. But you hate sin. This kind of goes along with Romans chapter 1, when in that passage there, um, Paul lists a, a bunch of sins. Every sin you can get. And then he says, you know, uh, I forget how he says it, but basically, and those who support those who do these things. 
You know, so if you just say it's, you know, or approve of, excuse me, that's what he says, those who approve of those who do these things. Well, I didn't do any sin, but I approve of you sinning. Well, then I'm basically guilty of that sin. In other words, my job as a Christian is to say, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that. I shouldn't approve of that. I should let you know that because it's sin, I hate that sin. I do not like that sin. He says, I hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do not loathe those who rise up against you. I hate them with complete hatred. So he goes on a little deeper. I count them as my enemies. Search me, verse 23, search me. In other words, look into me, look into my life, look into my soul, O God. And know my heart. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if we've ever said that. Okay, God, just search me. Go to my mind. Look at my heart. Look at my life. Am I doing good or not so much? You know. Because we're kind of laid out before God. And that's what David's saying. I, I'm just laid out before God. Search me and look at me. You know, try me. You know, I've had, David's basically saying, I, I've had sin in my life. I, I, at this point, I've overcome that sin, but I'm trying to, to do my best, and, and I don't like sin. I hate sin, and if it's against you, God, I hate it. I, I With complete hatred, look at me, God. Search my heart. Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Oh, we get, looked at that a couple weeks ago a little bit. It, there was a different verse with the same thought there. Of God knowing, you know, whatever's going on in, in our brain, in our mind. He knows our thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the everlasting. In other words, God, look at my mind, look at my thoughts. And, and if you see that there's anything that should not be there, put me on the right path. Take that out, get that out, put me on the right path towards everlasting, in other words, heaven. So the psalm ends unlike we might think or expect. David calls for the avenging of his enemies. Now David's two requests to the Lord are just to destroy his enemies in, in verse 16 or 19, excuse me, and, and test himself, to test me, and point out anything that offended you. Now this is interesting because most of us would not ask these things of another person. We wouldn't look at somebody else and okay, test me, and, and, and I want you to, to just tell me anything that I've ever done in my life to offend you. That's kind of like an open book, isn't it? And that person will go, oh, well, let me get my pad of paper ready. You know, I will make a list. But, we, but David says that to God, because God already knows anyone. And, and he admits to God that his thoughts are anxious thoughts in verse 23. Unlike, of course, God's thoughts, which are comforting in verses 17 and 18. So how can David hate his enemies? Because, you know, I thought, we thought that we were supposed to love our enemies. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? Matthew 5 and verse 44 says, But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And so certainly Jesus says that we must love our enemies. But David shows that we must always hate what God hates, and that's what? That three-letter word, sin. And that's what he's looking at when he says, search me, O Lord. Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if you see any grievous way in me, we went through x-ray, airport x-ray the other day, and I find that amazing. Over the years, the, the little thing, conveyor belt that you put your bag on, you know, you go through your screening process and you put whatever carry-on things you have and you take out your wallet or whatever and everything goes through this little thing and they look at it on a TV monitor. And this x-ray, you can see basically, they've come a long way in these x-rays, by the way. You can see in color, everything that is in that bag or at least somewhat of a color outline of everything that's in that bag there's no secrets basically and so they you know goes through they stop it they look if there's anything threatening 
or, or that shouldn't be there or whatever, you know, and, and then if there is, they pull it aside and you got to explain yourself or, you know, or, or, you know, they look at it and say, okay, that's all right, or whichever they do. Um, but isn't that the process with God? God can see into us. And so tonight, if we're struggling, I might know it. Nobody else here might not know it. But you know what? God knows it. Whether we're struggling with a challenge in our life, a sin in our life, or whatever it is, or just maybe it's a faith issue. God knows that we're struggling with that. And if we're wide open to God, God wants us to, to come to him and, and let him help with that problem. And, and he certainly will. We come to God through prayer. Or perhaps tonight, maybe you've, you're struggling with you have to become a Christian. Well, heaven is a wonderful place, as they say, filled with glory and grace. And there's that song, I want to see my Savior's face. Well, I, I can't see it. Unless I go to heaven. So maybe tonight you're ready to be baptized into Christ. Why don't you come to the front as we stand and as we sing? Jesus is coming, coming, coming. Jesus is coming today. Why should I linger? Linger.
And uh, let's uh, go to God in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this time to thank you, Father, for supplying us with this bread and this opportunity to partake of it at this time. But more importantly, Father, we thank you, Father, for the what it represents, Father, the sacrifice of Christ's body. And we just pray, Father, that as we partake of this bread, we we'll do it in a way that be uh, uh, pleasing unto you. And we pray this through his holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's continue in prayer. Dear Father, we uh, also would like to thank you this time for supplying us with this fruit of the vine, which we can partake at this time. But more importantly, again, Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of the blood that was shed. And we just pray, Father, that uh, we would keep in mind the, the seriousness of this. Uh, of this fruit of the vine which we are taking this time and the reason we're taking it and uh, we just thank you Father for sacrificing on the cross and the blood that was shed we pray this through Jesus' holy name Amen well <clears throat> that concludes the services for this evening is uh, there any other announcements that need to be made Okay. Well, uh, we'll have a closing prayer and be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we again approach your throne, Father, with thanksgiving again for this day you've given us. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, as we uh, leave here this evening and go our separate ways, that, that you'll watch over us each and guide us and keep us safe on our travels. We pray, Father, that uh, we would be able to take the lessons we've heard today and the Bible studies we've had and uh, take the things we've learned and uh, use them to help better serve you. Uh, we pray, Father, for all those who are not here for uh, sicknesses or whatever the issue may be, Father. We just, you know everyone's issues, Father. And you know their, their struggles. We especially pray, Father, for those who are having... Uh, issues with their faith this time and those that are not here because of a lack of faith. Uh, we pray, Father, that uh, either we may say the correct words to them or somehow you can touch their hearts, Father, and they could return to the fold. We know, Father, that each and every one of us falls short and, and we just pray, Father, you'd forgive us when we do fall short and help us to Stay focused and uh, just strive ahead and try to do better, Father. Help us to take uh, our lives just one day at a time, face our battles one at a time, and, and just help us to make it through our daily lives. We pray, Father, all these things through your Son Jesus' holy name. Amen.